All right, so in the previous video, we talked about the big picture of gluconeogenesis, or the creation of new glucose. And I brought up this diagram of glycolysis, and I said to you, essentially, glycolysis, which starts off with glucose that you can see in the kind of top middle left, and is broken down, oxidized into pyruvate, the molecule kind of in the top left there. I said that this pathway is essentially the reverse of gluconeogenesis. That is to say, we want to start off with pyruvate, and we want to essentially reverse the pathways to produce glucose glucose, which we can pump into our blood in times of fasting. But notably, in this video, I want to get a little bit more detail-oriented and talk about kind of three unique reactions to gluconeogenesis that overcome the three irreversible steps indicated by the orange arrows in this diagram of glycolysis. All right, so let's talk about the first roadblock that we need to overcome, which is in the conversion of pyruvate to phosphoenolpyruvate. So remember, it can't just use pyruvate kinase to reverse this reaction. So it actually uses an entirely separate set of enzymes and pathway to get to phosphoenolpyruvate. And the first step is the conversion of pyruvate to a molecule called oxaloacetate, which is abbreviated usually as OAA. And this is a molecule that you will meet when you learn about the Krebs cycle. It's a intermediate in one of those steps. And notably, this is why amino acids are able to be used to produce glucose, because amino acids, once they're broken down, can be actually converted to oxaloacetate. And from there, of course, they can continue down this pathway. Notably, another um, precursor molecule that I mentioned before, lactate, can be interchangeably produced from pyruvate or going from lactate to pyruvate. So that's another way that that metabolite contributes to gluconeogenesis. But back to oxaloacetate. So once this is produced, oxaloacetate can then be catalyzed to form phosphoenolpyruvate using another enzyme. And the names of these enzymes aren't terribly important, but I will mention them because they do sometimes come up. So the first step involves an enzyme called pyruvate carboxylase. And notably, kind of one way that I remember this is because oxaloacetate is actually a four carbon molecule. So pyruvate, recall, is a three carbon molecule. So this carboxylase enzyme is essentially adding another carbon through a carboxy group to this oxaloacetate molecule. And then this oxaloacetate molecule is converted back to a three carbon intermediate by an enzyme called PEP, which stands for phosphoenolpyruvate for short, PEP converted by PEP carboxy kinase. And of course, kinase involves the phosphorylation of something. And so we know actually intuitively that because gluconeogenesis is an anabolic process, we're building something up, it requires energy. And energy comes usually in the form of ATP. And turns out that this first step of the reaction does involve ATP, so I'm going to say plus ATP, and the second step where this kinase is involved also involves energy in the form of GTP, which is pretty much the equivalent of ATP, but of course we have this G, which is just guanine, a different nucleotide base, but this, of course, we know the energy is derived from these phosphate groups, so essentially we can think of these things as being the same. All right, so one roadblock down and two left to go. So once we have our phosphoenolpyruvate, we're good to go. We shuttle down this pathway until we hit our next roadblock, which is in the conversion of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6 phosphate. So the way our body does this is it actually uses a different enzyme. So normally phosphofructokinase is used to convert fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And instead, in gluconeogenesis, going the opposite direction, the body uses an enzyme called fructose 1,6. So we're talking about the same molecule here. But instead of kinase, we're using a biphosphotase. It's kind of a mouthful, 
but just recognize that a phosphatase is the exact opposite of a kinase. So whereas kinases involve phosphorylation, usually using phosphate groups from molecules like ATP, a phosphatase takes these phosphates away. So naturally, it makes sense that if a kinase is used in going from fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, we'd want to take a phosphate group off going the opposite direction. So that's exactly what we do. Now, one kind of point of confusion that kind of I had when I was learning this was, you know, we always learn that the enzyme of the reaction can't really change whether a reaction is irreversible or not. So I want to point out that it's not just an enzyme that we're switching out and going and kind of in circumventing this irreversible reaction because that really wouldn't do anything. If a reaction has a negative delta G value, it will always have a negative delta G value um, and changing the enzyme won't change the delta G value. Remember, kinetics and thermodynamics are separate entities. And so I want to point out to you that it's really this entire reaction pathway that's changing. And notably notice, remember that ATP in this step is hydrolyzed to ADP. And this reaction is coupled normally to the phosphorylation with the enzyme phosphofructokinase. But this hydrolysis of ATP is absent in gluconeogenesis. So we can essentially think about this switch an enzyme as really encompassing a larger change in the entire pathway going from fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. So I hope that's clear. So now that we have gotten past this second roadblock, we continue down until we hit our final and last roadblock in going from glucose 6-phosphate to glucose. And again, just essentially just like we did for our previous reaction, our body has come up with a different reaction pathway involving a different enzyme. So normally, you remember, hexokinase is used in converting glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, but our body uses a different enzyme. In this case, I'm going to write it out here. It uses the enzyme glucose 6, and remember, if we used a kinase, we have to be using a Exactly, we're using a phosphatase. So glucose 6-phosphatase, which will remove this phosphate group from the glucose to <laughs> remove this phosphate group from the glucose 6-phosphate to form the glucose. Now, just as a fun kind of intriguing fact, it turns out that some people are actually missing this enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase. So can you imagine what would happen if they're missing this enzyme? And indeed, without this enzyme, we can't produce glucose. So it's kind of sad, right? Because those individuals can perform all of these reactions leading up to glucose 6-phosphate, but it can't ever produce glucose. And what's actually even more interesting about this enzyme is this enzyme is also used in the breakdown of glycogen, which if you remember we mentioned earlier as that polymer of glucose that's used kind of as a first line dumping mechanism for glucose into the blood during our fasting state. So not only are these individuals unable to produce glucose using gluconeogenesis, but they're also unable to break down their glycogen, which means that they're severely hypo glycemic. So without this enzyme, got to have an arrow and cross it out. Without this enzyme, individuals are hypo or low in glucose. And of course, this is a very life-threatening condition because our body needs glucose to survive. All right, so just kind of as one final word, I want to say that when I was first learning about gluconeogenesis and glycolysis, I wanted to memorize all of the names of all the molecules and all the enzymes and Speaking of enzymes, I think I spelled one wrong here. This is supposed to be 1,6-bisphosphate, but despite that, really, I guess the key point I want to say is that, you know, these names can be important when we're talking about specific diseases, like this deficiency of glucose 6-phosphatase, but conceptually, it's, I think, enough to realize at this point that gluconeogenesis and glycolysis are essentially opposites minus these three irreversible steps for which our body has created three unique reaction pathways for which gluconeogenesis can occur. So that's kind of the big, big takeaway from this video.